Hi everyone, welcome to Cup ADM Sailing. My name is Marco, I'm the Sail Canada Cruising Instructor, and in today's video I'll be talking about the nautical chart and how to read one. Welcome to episode 30, the nautical chart. This video will be an introduction to nautical charts and how to read them. I want to emphasize the point that this is an introduction, as it is a very vast topic. Also, this video will best be viewed on a larger screen. Many of the details on a chart are just too small to see properly on a small screen. I will be covering the following information found on the chart. The title block the scale, the projection, which is how a round sphere is interpreted on a flat surface, depths and elevations as they relate to tide tables, symbols, abbreviations, and terms, including depths or soundings as they're correctly called, what the different colors mean, the compass rows, and finally I will touch on digital charts. Plotting will be the subject of a future video. Let's start with the title block. At the top of the title block, you will usually find the logo of the agency responsible for producing the chart. In Canada, this is the Canadian Hydrographic Service. In the US, it's NOAA's Office of Coast Survey. And in the UK, the Hydrographic Office produces Admiralty charts. Working your way down the title block, the next thing you come to is the title which is self-explanatory, so I will not say any more about that. Then we have the scale of the chart, which is essentially the ratio of a distance on the chart to the corresponding distance on the ground or water. In this example, the scale is 1 to 25,000. The closer to life size, 1 to 1, the larger the scale. So 1 to 10,000 is considered large scale compared to 1 to 80,000, even though 1 to 10,000 is the smaller number. Another way to look at it is that large-scale charts zoom in, so details are larger. Small-scale charts cover large areas and are used for planning purposes or navigating in open water. Large-scale charts are used when more information is needed, such as when approaching land or cruising inshore. The closer to land and the more congested the navigational area, the larger the scale of the chart being used should be. In this example, a distance scale is printed in the title block. That is not always the case. If there is no distance scale, or if the distance scale is not conveniently at hand, distance is measured using the latitude scale on the sides of the chart. One minute of latitude equals one nautical mile. It is extremely important to only use the latitude scale for measuring distance, since the meridians of longitude get closer together as they approach the poles. One minute of longitude only equals one nautical mile at the equator. Next, we come to the projection of the chart. This is simply the way a round sphere is represented on a flat surface. There are numerous types of projection, but navigational charts are usually Mercator's projection. It is favored for marine navigation since lines of constant direction appear as straight lines on the chart. The meridians and parallels join at right angles, which is also a benefit for plotting courses and bearings. The disadvantage of Mercator's projection is that it distorts the shape and relative size of continents, particularly near the poles. For the relatively large-scale charts used in coastal navigation, though, this is not usually a concern. Depths are measured from chart datum, which on Canadian charts is lowest low water large tide, LLWLT, or lowest normal tide. Most charts are metric, but U.S. charts are in feet, and some older charts might still be in fathoms. A fathom, by the way, is equal to six feet. Also, different countries use different datums. The U.S. uses mean lower low water, which is not as low as LLWLT. In the U.K., chart datum is normally the level of lowest astronomical tide. Don't get caught up in all this terminology. Just be sure to know what the datum is for your particular chart. 
Elevations and clearances, like bridges, in Canada are measured from higher high water large tide, HHWLT. But once again, different countries use different clearances, so be very sure of which datum is being used before transiting under a bridge or cable. On topographic maps, the legend for the symbols used on the map is usually printed on the back of the map. For nautical charts, the legend is printed in a publication, ironically called chart number one. There is a key on the back of the publication to help narrow down your search. So, for example, let's say we're looking for this symbol in chart number one. We would look for the symbol in the key that most closely resembles the symbol we are looking for. In this case, the little plus sign. We see that it is in section K, rocks, wrecks, and obstructions. So we turn to section K and we see that there are two columns. The left column is for symbols used in international charts. In Canada, for CHS charts, we always use the right column. Looking in the right column, we find the symbol that we're looking for. It might be hard to see on the screen, but this is what the symbol looks like, and it means a rock, a wash, a chart datum. This means that at chart datum, or lowest normal tide, the top of the rock is even with the surface. Another way that it can be expressed is seen here, and the underlining of the zero means that it uncovers at a zero tide, or once again, chart datum. On US charts, symbols are also published in chart number one, and the layout is very similar to the Canadian chart number one, with the exception that there are more columns. Once again, the left column is used for international charts. The middle column is used for NOAA charts. A fourth and fifth column is for NGA symbols, National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, and the furthest right column is for ECDIS, which stands for Electronic Chart Display and Information Systems. Most US charts are NOAA, so that will be the most commonly used column. Just make sure not to get mixed up. In the UK, publication NP5011 is published by the UK Hydrographic Office. I have included links to PDFs of US and Canadian chart number one publications, but could not find a free link to NP5011. One of the only symbols included in the title block that can also be found in chart number one is this A in a diamond. You will find the symbol on a chart where there is tabulated tidal stream data, specifically tidal currents. In the case of this example, it further states that you can find that information in volume five of the Canadian tide and current tables. Incidentally, while tide and current tables are both published in the same volume, make sure to use tide tables for tides, which represent vertical movement of water, or depth, and current tables for horizontal movement, or flow. For more on tide tables, please refer to my video on reading tide tables. I will be making a video on current tables at some future point. That's all I'm going to cover in the title block. So now, let's look at the colors used on charts. Once again, they will vary somewhat between agencies. On this chart, the white is water deeper than 15 meters at chart datum. The numbers that you see are called soundings, and they correspond to depths. If there is a subscript, like in this example, it means 13.4 meters on a metric chart. On an old chart, still using fathoms, remember that a fathom is 6 feet, it would mean 13 fathoms 4 feet, or 82 feet. The light blue are depths of 5 to 15 meters. The darker blue are depths of 0 to 5 meters. The green is the range between the highest and lowest tides, or the intertidal zone, and the buff, or beige, is land above HHWLT. On some smaller scale charts, the white areas are depths greater than 10 meters. As mentioned, I will not be covering plotting in this video, but I did want to include an introduction to the compass rose and its uses. One or more compass roses are usually printed on the chart. The compass rose indicates the direction of true and magnetic north and can be used to determine current magnetic variation if the chart is out of date. Using parallel rules or a rolling plotter, the compass rose can be used to plot courses or bearings on the chart. In reality, 
Most sailing yachts do not have large enough nav tables to be able to unfold a full-size chart, so protractors and various other plotters are usually used. In this example, we see that the outer ring of the compass rose indicates true north. This is the North Pole and never changes. The inner ring indicates the magnetic variation, east or west of true north, for the year that the chart was issued. It also provides the amount of annual change so that it can be calculated for the current year. I will save that procedure for a future video on plotting. In this day and age, I would be remiss not to include a brief discussion on digital charts. Once again, an in-depth look at digital charts and all the available applications and plotters will be saved for a future video, but I did want to go over a few points. First and foremost, it is my firm belief that you should always back up digital charts and plotters with paper charts and instruments. Not only that, but you should know how to use them, and you should practice regularly. I, for one, have had several occasions where I had to fall back on paper charts for various reasons. I would never put to sea without paper charts. It's just not worth the risk. I personally like iNavX, which I use on an iPad. Navionics is probably the most popular app out there, and I do have it on my phone, but I prefer the sophistication of the iNavX platform. Also, I like using CHS charts, which is what I'm used to, and I do not like the look of the Navionics charts. There are others, but whichever application you choose, make sure you practice with it and understand it before heading out. And don't forget those paper charts. New episodes go up every second Wednesday at 6 p.m. See you next time when I discuss dressing for sailing in fine weather and foul. Thanks for watching. Until then, I wish you all fair winds and following seas.